Um, so today I have the pleasure to introduce Veit Weilhammer from the Charité University Clinic here in Berlin. Veit has received both his medical license and his doctoral degree in 2015, and the latter in the Visual Perception Laboratory at Charité under the supervision of Professor Philipp Sterzer, who, by the way, will give a talk in the series as well in December. And since 2015, Fight has been training as a psychiatrist and psychotherapist, and at the same time teaching courses and continuing active research as a postdoctoral fellow in the Visual Perception Lab. His research focuses on predictive coding and more broadly Bayesian accounts of various mental disorders and conscious experience, and he has already published an impressive number of papers on perceptual illusions, bistable perception, and psychotic delusions, to highlight just a few. And today he will present his recent work on the role of the inferior frontal cortex in conscious experience, as well as the role of predictive processes in altered states of consciousness. So, fight, welcome, and we're excited to hear talk now. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure and I'm, I'm very happy to show a little bit um, of our research here in the, in the presentation. Um, so uh, really one of my interests is uh, the neural basis of consciousness. And I think that there's no better way to start uh, with respect to consciousness than in science fiction. And uh, one of my favorite science fiction stories basically is The Ghost in the Shell. Many might know it. It used to be uh, an anime and now it's also a Hollywood movie. And basically the story is set in a very distant and very dystopian future. It's 2029 where humans are more and more augmented with machine parts. So that specific body parts become machines. Um, there is however always um, a, like a remnant of biological tissue which is the ghost, basically, that is the host for consciousness and the self, and the rest is the artificial shell. The hero, uh, she's called Motoko Kusanagi, especially because her whole body has been replaced by artificial parts, and still in the story, she's searching for her ghost in the shell. And I think it's a, a nice metaphor for many different problems that we face in consciousness research, and I just want to highlight five that I think are, are, are quite relevant. Um, the first one being the difficult problem of subjectivity. So if you imagine Motoko, the hero that is all machine, having a conscious experience of a watermelon, then for us, because her, her brain is all machine, it is super easy, very easy to, to really describe in every detail all the, all the things that happen at the point in time where she has the conscious experience of the water, watermelon. However, for her, the experience is subjective, so it's a first-person experience, and we have a third-person view or perspective on, on, on the things that happen when she's conscious of the watermelon. So the two things are not the same and really have riddled scientists for more than two millennia. Uh, this has been called the mind-body problem or also the heart uh, problem of consciousness. Heart, maybe even a euphemism because it sometimes seems to me very difficult to squeeze uh, the subjective out of the objective. It's also super relevant in psychiatry. The mind-body dualism really is pervasive in our thinking about the mind and often makes it difficult for patients to realize that some aspects of what they perceive might be a, a problem that is related to, to neural processing and not something that is existing in the realm of, of psychology or the soul only. However, even if it might be difficult to really describe uh, what subjectivity means in empirical terms, it's still worthwhile, I would argue, to better understand the biological shell of consciousness. Um, and that's basically, to me, the search for the neural correlates of consciousness. What does this mean? So this is basically the, the set of neural activity that makes the difference between a stimulus being perceived unconsciously as opposed to consciously, um, or a set of neural regions or activities that are jointly sufficient to generate conscious experiences. And this is still a matter of debate. So there's a big debate whether uh, activity in the feature selective regions of the sensory cortices is, is sufficient for conscious experience or whether you need prefrontal cortical activity as well to have conscious experiences. If we could understand this better, we would be able to make progress on many pressing questions in the scientific study of consciousness. For example, um, 
at what scale does conscious experience emerge? Is it just uh, cells or group of cells that interact with each other, or do you need multiple brain regions or even brains to sustain consciousness? Likewise, um, it could help us to better understand the biological function of consciousness. So it's pretty clear that consciousness emerged several times along this evolutionary tree of life. It's surely present in mammals, um, and we also know that it's uh, present in uh, cephalopods, so octopus, squid, um, and we divided from them in this tree of life at a point where life was just sponges that had just a bunch of neurons, so it's very likely that two, the two branches developed consciousness independently of each other, maybe under different circumstances and, and for different reasons. Also, it might mean that, uh, so if we discover the, the function of consciousness, it might help us to detect consciousness not only in animals, other than humans, but also in artificial agents that might exist in the future. So if you imagine that artificial agents, now they do have striking abilities in specific subfunctions, but they don't have the general function of, of human intelligence, and that might not be even the same as consciousness. And still, um, again, it's worthwhile uh, trying to understand what you need to detect consciousness outside of even the biological realm. Again, because science fiction tells us that this is important and we should be prepared for the event of uh, conscious artificial beings. So those are the five problems that I think are very important in the scientific study of consciousness. And what you can expect me to talk about today a lot is mechanisms of conscious experience. And I will also talk a bit about the scale and the function of conscious experiences and the regions that are implicated in it. I'm not going to talk about detecting conscious experience outside of the, the, the human mind. And I'm also not going to talk about the difficult and very interesting question of subjectivity. So mechanisms of conscious experience, how could you find them? But the most naive thing to do, uh, for example, would be to put a person in a scanner and an MRI scanner and you would uh, flash pulses of light and you instruct the participant to press a button whenever she or he has the conscious experience of the light. And what you might end up with might be a map that looks a bit like this. So you have feature selective regions of visual cortex, parietal and prefrontal cortical regions. Of course, all of you know that this is not tantamount to the neural correlates of consciousness. Um, so for example, remember we flashed pulses of light so part of this activity you find is just be being driven by the stimulus itself, has nothing to do with consciousness um, um, in, in particular. Also, uh, the participant had to press a button whenever she or he was conscious of the light, so you're also bound to find uh, motor-related activity. And maybe finally, the experiment was very long and the attention of the participant went up and down throughout, and when she was less attentive to the task, she was less likely to detect the pulse of light, didn't press the button. So my, maybe if you just look at the, the flashes of light that she reports, having perceived consciously, you might also end up with the correlates of attention. And again, those might not be the same um, as uh, consciousness or the neural correlates of consciousness in, in particular. So really what you need to find uh, neural activity that is relevant for consciousness is some sort of experiment that at least partially dissociates these alternative cognitive functions from the, the, the neural basis of consciousness itself. Okay. And I would argue that one way to do it is perceptual bistability, something we do at the lab a lot. Um, here are a few examples of perceptual bistability. So the mecha cube can be seen in two uh, spatial orientations. Here you have the face-vase illusion, so you either see two faces facing each other, or you see a vase. This is apparent motion. If you show these two frames in succession, um, then people either perceive vertical or uh, vertical or horizontal motion. Here on the right, also famous example, binocular rivalry. So the left eye sees this red grating, the blue eye sees the blue, the, the, the right eye sees the blue grating, and you end up not with a mixture of the two usually, but you see for prolonged periods either red and then blue and like a mixed period in between maybe. In our lab, we have used a lot of these uh, stimuli in the middle, uh, structure from motion stimuli. Um, and this, uh, this is one example. So here on the screen, you should, you sh you should now see um, an object rotating around the vertical axis. And for 50% of you, uh, you can also write it in the chat if you want, 
the front surface is going to move toward the left. And the other half of you is going to see the front surface of the sphere moving toward the right. And the reason for this um, discrepancy is that well, actually on the screen there's 2D motion and there is the illusion of the 3D sphere, which is completely ambiguous. So at each point in time, it's com equally compatible uh, with leftward and rightward rotation. If you focus on the thing for longer, um, so if you fixate the dot in the middle, maybe some of you have already seen a change in direction of rotation. And again, this change occurs in the absence of any change in physical stimulation. This is just endogenous uh, events that, that somehow are triggered when viewing the stimulus and, and you will see first right and then left or the other way around. We can also replay this um, to have a control condition. Uh, this is usually done by adding 3D information to the stimulus. So if you see me, I don't know, in the speaker cam, you would wear glasses like this, red, blue filter glasses. So here you see now pairs of red and blue dots and they basically generate a 3D signal that lets me, the experimenter, control what you see on the screen. And then I can basically have physical changes in the stimulus that, in, that induce uh, changes in conscious experience, basically. And I compare the two. When you compare the endogenous changes uh, during biostability with these uh, control events, then you actually get a map that looks like this. So you find activity in, in feature selective regions, in particular in uh, V5HMT plus, that's feature selective region for motion. And you also find parietal activity and prefrontal activity, most consistently in the inferior frontal gyrus, the region that is right here. And it's basically the anterior insula and the adjacent inferior frontal uh, gyrus. And just to repeat, this is activity really at these points in time where, where there's a change in direction of rotation. Um, there is a big debate in the field um, uh, where this activity, especially in prefrontal cortex, comes from. Some argue that actually these changes in conscious experience are realized in, in, in visual cortex, and then what's happening in prefrontal cortex is this downstream consequence. Uh, has to do maybe with introspection, metacognition, uh, motor behavior, things like that. There's the opposite view, saying that actually the events are triggered in prefrontal cortex and then are fed back to, to visual cortex, um, but they really are triggered in prefrontal cortex according to the top-down view. And then there's a hybrid view that basically argues the conflict in the stimulus, the ambiguity is detected in visual cortex, and this, this ambiguity or conflict is fed forward to prefrontal cortex. It accumulates over time, and at some point, prefrontal cortex initiates a reinterpretation of the stimulus, and then that's why there's a change in conscious experience. And this hybrid model uh, is a bit like a homeostatic idea and is closely related to the concept of predictive coding. So here, uh, imagine you are seeing the sphere rotating, to, rotating toward the left. Then in our view, this would be a prior belief about the most likely cause of sensory stimulation, namely a sphere turning toward the left. And this, this unimodal prior is combined with this bimodal likelihood that has equivalent evidence for left and rightward rotation into a bimodal posterior that determines perception or conscious experience. And you see here, because you have this belief about the rotation of the stimulus, that there's more evidence for leftward rotation. But however, there's also residual evidence for the alternative. And in our view, this, um, this constitutes a prediction error signal that over time gradually weakens the prior, adapts your belief about uh, what is on the screen that you're seeing. There. So over time, the prior gets weaker, and con by consequence, the prediction error escalates until at some point the prior is almost balanced and this, the likelihood of having a, a change, a switch in conscious experience is maximum. And once you switch, you just reinitiate the process. So what happens here on the bottom, while perception is constant, you see rotating toward the left, prediction errors here in black, they escalate until there is a change in con conscious experience. So the idea here is that these changes in consciousness basically reduce prediction errors, a, a way of reducing prediction errors or conflict. You can also modulate this with external sensory information to make it more, let's say, comparable to real life uh, scenarios. And the way we do it is basically by introducing a partial disambiguation on the stimulus. 
so again here this is the sphere and now you see that purple dots and red blue dot pairs and uh, so again if you have these glasses the purple dots they go through both filters the same but the red blue dot pairs they induce a 3d signal and they dis partially disambiguate the stimulus the more of the red blue dot pairs you have the higher the signal to ambiguity ratio and the more the experimenter can determine what you see on the screen for you now if you don't have the glasses it's still completely ambiguous of course so with these manipulations you can basically have faces of the stimulus that are congruent and that are incongruent to the sensory information on the screen uh, the prediction errors are attenuated when perception is congruent and they escalate when perception is incongruent to the stimulus. What we've done basically to find out where this prediction error lives in the brain, we have two groups of participants and they basically did these experiments. We used this behavioral model. You can invert this just based on the behavior of the participant. And then we extracted these prediction error time courses and checked whether we could find the neural correlate of these prediction errors in the brain. And we found in two experiments, they are here always in red and blue, that both the inferior frontal cortex and the feature selective region for motion, V5HMT, encodes these prediction errors. So in these regions, uh, neural activity here over time goes up, and then uh, after the switch goes back down to baseline. Um, we used dynamic causal modeling to find out where the prediction error is more likely to come from. And we found across the two experiments, it's more likely to come from v 5 hmd plus and then being fed forward to prefrontal cortex. Um, we also decoded um, the current conscious experience uh, on these stimuli. And we found that it's very easy to decode um, direction of rotation from low level areas like v 5 hmd plus It's not so easy for inferior frontal cortex. We couldn't decode from there. Uh, that made uh, V5HMT plus particularly interesting. And uh, we looked at voxel populations within V5HMT plus um, that preferred either leftward or rightward rotation. So voxels that prefer leftward rotation are more active when you perceive leftward rotation and vice versa for rightward voxels. Uh, the interesting thing was that predictive coding would argue that the voxels that encode the currently suppressed direction of rotation, so you see leftward, the voxels that actually prefer rightward should encode the prediction error and the other way around if you see rightward rotation. And that was actually that's, that is what, what we found actually. So the voxels that are currently suppressed encode the prediction error, which is then fed forward to a prefrontal cortex, inferior frontal cortex. So really these uh, MRI results, they said, okay, prediction errors during perceptual by, by stability, they live in both V5, H, and T plus and prefrontal cortex, but it's more likely that they come from V5, most, uh, in particular from the voxels that encode the currently suppressed stimulus interpretation. And then they are fed forward to IFC, to prefrontal cortex. In a second step, we asked whether this prefrontal representation of prediction errors or conflict is relevant for conscious experience. And to do this, we basically used a causal experiment. We had a theta burst intervention in the participants who underwent the MRI experiment. So this was a neural navigated um, uh, theta burst intervention. Theta burst is a TMS um, uh, mode where you can basically suppress neural activity for 30 minutes after stimulation. And participants did the experiment before and after stimulation. And there was also control stimulation um, in addition to the vertex, to the IFC stimulation at the vertex. So we thought that if the IFC representation has a causal role uh, in, in conscious experience, then we should get, to, should take longer for people to switch between left and right rotation of the sphere when there's a virtual lesion in prefrontal cortex so after TMS to, to IFC basically. And this is again what we found. So here you see the uh, the post pre difference, and it's positive when you when it takes longer to switch, and that this happened uh, put, uh, only after the IFC control stimulation. There was no effect on perceptual uncertainty, no effect on motor behavior, and strikingly, um, actually, people who had strong prediction error representations in prefrontal cortex had a stronger effect of the TMS intervention, meaning that the functional features of this uh, neural activity in IFC seem to be relevant. We also checked whether this was um, basically specific to the IFC and to this end we ran a whole brain searchlight support vector regression analysis trying to predict from patterns of voxel activity 
the individual differences in the uh, TMS effect, and we found we could predict at a um, whole brain correction level only from the site of stimulation. So these regions actually predicted the strength of the TMS effect in the, in the paradigm. So to summarize, really, we found quite some evidence for the hybrid model, namely that um, conflict seems to be detected in visual cortex and fed forward to prefrontal cortex. And then there's a causal component of this activity on conscious experience, potentially via feedback to visual cortex. This has something to do with uh, mechanisms of conscious experience. So this really highlights prefrontal cortex as a key region for selecting the contents of conscious experience or, to, by, or, or also for regulating the access of conflicting information into conscious experience. So it also speaks about the function of prefrontal cortex and conscious experience. Um, in the second part of the talk, I would like to uh, illustrate a bit how this might relate to psychotic phenomena. Um, and to start there, I'm, I'm just going to give an example from uh, another passion of mine, guilty pleasure, computer games. Um, and uh, I want to show you gameplay from a very recent game, which is called The Last of Us 2. Uh, maybe some of you know it. And I'm showing this to you because I'm just extremely, um, I was extremely surprised about the detail in the graphic, graphics of this game. It's just extremely detailed and the games developed very, very quickly over the last 10 to 20 years, um, being increasingly lifelike if you play them. However, um, when you play this game, your machine will probably use uh, something like 300 to 500 joules per second to generate this uh, gameplay for you. Our brains, on the other hand, they may even be able to generate more high quality conscious experiences, but they only use 20 joules per second. So it's really an order of magnitude. Uh, lower what the brain needs in term of, terms of energy to generate these uh, these experiences that we have. Uh, why is that? Um, so if you look at the machine that gives you the computer games, then this is basically information being processed in serial and feed forwards. So on the left is like from the internet. If you want to build your own graphic card, it's a bit like this, and you can see information flows in one direction. The same really for seminal work on on how visual cortex works. So simple cells and complex cells, and they are somehow serially connected. And the simple cells do more simple stuff. And the complex cells, they pool across the simple cells so they can do more complex stuff. But again, information flows in one direction in this, in this, uh, in this idea. This is also borne out in many, many concepts on how visual, uh, the visual systems work, um, so the Dawson and the Ventral Pathway. And it's also a really important feature of many, many very capable machine learning algorithms that you can use today for classification. Information flows in one direction. Okay. However, if you look at the, the gameplay again, you can see um, that those are individual frames from the, the game I just showed you. And what you will realize if you look at this is that one of those frames gives you a lot of information for the frame that comes next. right? Um, and as you know, and I know this is a seminar about predictive coding, this uh, using predictions from the sequence of preceding states allows you to, to, to compress the information in each frame. So you, if you just process what is surprising, only the prediction errors, you really reduce the amount of information you need to take in. And by that, you're able to reduce the, the energy, potentially, that you need to have high quality conscious experiences by focusing on internal models, predictions, basically. So here, again, as a diagram, those are the frames in purple or your conscious experiences. And then there are predictions that really map from one to the next. So each conscious experience has lots of predictive value for the one that comes next. Uh, or here you see the posterior. Uh, if you look at it in Bayesian terms, there's a prediction about the input and prediction errors. They update the posterior. Again, focusing on internal models is a really cool idea by nature. And predictive coding is one way to do it. And it gives you many, many advantages. And um, one of them might be you, you just strongly reduce the amount of energy you need to have high quality conscious experiences. However, it comes at a cost. So as you can see here, information goes can go in circles. Imagine you have a, an app errand posterior. It doesn't match reality and predictions are very strong. You might mistake um, the activity that comes back as something that comes from the outside. Uh, so you might actually uh, have what your internal model does 
must not necessarily or does not necessarily represent the nature of external reality and that's a problem that you that's a cost that you that you have to pay if you focus strongly on internal models um, there is some evidence that this is how the brain works because most many of the connections are feedback we know this already um, but to make this feedback worthwhile, to get the, the benefits out of this, uh, let's say, internal model thing, you really need to balance the effects of predictions and prediction errors. You need to know how strong you, strong you can trust in them if you do perceptual decision making. Um, this can lead to hallucinations if you don't do it well. So on the left side here, you see, um, for example, uh, on, on, on the x-axis, you see absence or presence of the stimulus in the log ratio. Uh, here the stimulus is absent, it's in, uh, in this uh, orange color, but you believe the stimulus to be there. If you do it optimally, then the posterior over time is gradually moving closer and closer to, to the likelihood. So you will probably say, no, there is no stimulus there. You can do this uh, in predictive coding if you just express the whole thing across levels, and then you can have these predictive estimators that basically in the end converge to you saying there is no stimulus. However, if you focus too strongly on the prior, that's the upper panel on the right, then the posterior is going to be stuck there and it's never going to reach to, down to the likelihood that the stimulus not being there. So having very strong priors might lead to hallucinations by really pressing sense information in conformity with your prior beliefs. The alternative, also possible, if prediction errors are too strong, if they, they receive too much weight and information is noisy as usual, then you might have large fluctuations in, in your posterior as shown here. And again, you might at some point have false alarms, detect a stimulus when there's nothing there. So both scenarios really might cause hallucinations. Here's an example I like a lot. It's the hollow mask illusion. So you're, you're looking at a mask uh, that rotates around the vertical axis. And um, this is the, the convex part of the mask. Um, and you will realize that now you're looking into the concave part of the mask, but you still see an upright face. There's still a convex face looking at you. So what's happening in this illusion is basically what you consciously perceive is really not what is on the screen when you look inside the concave part of the mask. And this happens also in real life. I've tried it out. If you have a, a real mask and you rotate, you'll have the strong experience of an upright face, even though you look inside the mask, into the concave part of the mask. So in, in Bayesian terms, this might be because you have a strong prior prediction about the likely anatomy of faces that really distorts your conscious experience away from what is actually on the screen. And for computational psychiatry, it was really interesting to see that patients that are diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia don't show this illusion so strongly. So they have it easier to see the concave part um, of the mask. Um, why might that be? So again, here you have these um, the, the components of Bayesian inference. You have a prior belief about the most likely anatomy of faces, and then there's stimulus information for a concave face. But because you have this strong belief and uh, the sense information is maybe a bit noisy, you end up with a conscious experience of an, of an upright or convex face, even though you look at the concave part of the mask. In Schizophrenia, potentially due, due to too much dopamine in the um, mesolimbic system, or maybe because of an NMDA receptor hypofunction, this is up for, this is up for discussion, um, you have weaker priors and or additionally hyper-precise hyper, hyper sensory information. You, you, you put too much weight on the noisy sensory information and you end up with a posterior close to the likelihood. So you have it easier to see um, the upright face. Uh, the, the concave face, sorry, when you look inside the mask. Um, we have used this biostability model really to check uh, whether this is the case in patients uh, diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and healthy controls, focusing on this uh, partial ambiguity thing I've shown you just before. So to remind you here, we have these stimuli that basically are partially ambiguous, and we, we, we basically vary the signal to ambiguity ratio from zero to 100% by the fraction of dots that are red, blue dot pairs, and that get a 3D signal when you look at them with these glasses. And if you go back to this, people who have a strong um, reliance on sensory information should be very good at the task. So they should have strong prediction errors when there's incongruency between conscious experience and the sensory information and really attenuate the prediction errors when they're congruent. 
Um, we did this, as I said, in a group of patients uh, diagnosed with uh, paranoid schizophrenia and uh, healthy controls. And we basically, basically found that patients, first of all, show a stronger increase in congruency when you have more sensory information. So they gain more from adding additional sensory information. Then they're better than controls at really saying what is on the screen. And this uh, sensitivity to sensory information correlated with a number of features of the diagnosis, namely perceptual anomalies. So patients who were hallucinating more strongly, uh, that's the P3 item of the PUNS, uh, a measure that you can use to, to, to measure how, how psychotic someone is, how, how, how severe the psychotic symptoms are, and the Cardiff anomalous perception scale. The patients who are very sensitive to, to conflicting sensory information uh, did hallucinate more and had more perceptual anomalies. So that spoke a little bit in favor of the idea that there might be uh, weak priors or hyper-precise sensory information in schizophrenia as a sort of computational endophenotype of this, uh, this disease. But however, this is still a, a very heavily debated uh, topic. Many people argue for the opposite, for example. There's lots of work that's saying that it's actually very precise priors that, that have an effect in schizophrenia. And this, works, this, work, this idea comes from work on conditioned hallucinations, where people are basically conditioned to hallucinate stimuli and noise. However, um, just in the context of our own work, um, if it's really true that patients who suffer from hallucinations um, are very sensitive to conflict, then this is interesting because we found that the inferior frontal cortex is basically a region that regulates the access of conflicting information into conscious experience. So one idea in terms of hallucinations could be to use um, non-invasive brain stimulation like TMS and test whether this can help to modulate hallucinations in the clinic. Uh, we also did an experiment that just ended and was just unblinded where we invited healthy volunteers uh, for a crossover design. So they went to our clinic and they got a ketamine infusion on one day. And on the other day, they got a placebo infusion. And they didn't know first uh, whether it was a placebo day or a ketamine day. Most of them, I can already say, noticed quite rapidly whether it was ketamine or not. And the idea here was that uh, with the ketamine, you can block the NMDA receptors that are really important for feedback connectivity in the brain. Um, so if you block the ketamine receptors, you might think that this makes priors less precise, predictive information is less precise, so you might gain a benefit in the task I just showed you for the, just as for the schizophrenic patients. So we are now analyzing the data and the idea, the, the hypothesis was, or the question was, could we replicate we found in the patients just by giving ketamine to healthy um, individuals. We don't know it yet, but I'm, I'm very here. I'm very excited, and hopefully, I can show you soon. Uh, another line of work that um, I've been into now in the last year is work on how to actually regulate the impact of prediction errors and predictions in perception. So, how can a healthy person? regulate how strongly to believe in, in predictive information and in prediction errors. And uh, we had this one study, a very small study with 20 people, where we basically wanted to know how much of disambiguating stimulus information do we need uh, to, to counterbalance it with uh, the, the effect of internal predictions. Uh, with the idea that there might be some sort of level that you can titrate where you just really have 50% of the trials are stim, uh, prediction congruent and 50% are uh, prediction incongruent. We didn't find that. Uh, we actually found that there's um, a, a strange behavior, uh, meaning that there are long periods here. You can see there was a stimulus either going to the left or toward the right, and the stimulus is these dashed lines and perception and conscious experience is the, the solid line. And there was a long period where people just had a very strong effect of internal predictions and basically didn't pay any attention to the sensory information. And then at some point, this really switched into another mode where they basically almost ignored the predictive information and just focused a lot on the sensory information. This is shown here on the, in the bottom as well. So first, this is like an internal mode or prediction mode uh, period where this otherwise effective uh, disambiguation of the sphere didn't play any role and they just uh, had a strong history effect, meaning that they saw what the, the trial before 
uh, how they experienced the trial before. And then it switched and they just really didn't have this bias toward the past anymore and just paid lot of, lots of attention to the, to the stimulus. Um, we have shown this now um, beyond this small study in a large group of people from an open data set, the confidence database. So we have basically 4,000 people over a million trials. And it seems that there are fluctuations in mode in these experiments. And we've also done it in the IBL database. This is a database that looks at mouse behavior in a perceptual decision-making task. And again, there we find these autocorrelations of uh, internal and external mode or prediction mode and sensory mode. And um, we have some simulations to, to, to suggest that this might help to get um, unambiguous learning signals that can tell you whether you can trust your predictions. You would get them if you, if you look at errors you make in internal mode or whether you can, can trust the external sensory data, how much uh, you can rely on that. And you would get information about this in, um, in external mode when you look a lot at the stimulus. However, if you don't have these modes, then all the errors are always ambiguous because as you know, there's the circularity between predictions and sensory information that really can't be, can't really squeeze it out uh, in total from, from this loop of Bayesian inference. So yeah, this is uh, ongoing work and, um, and again, here, I'm hoping that we can soon sh show more data, also looking at neural activity that got, goes along with these modes, uh, potentially in MRI uh, or uh, intracranial recordings in mice. To sum up, um, I've shown you two sets of uh, results from our lab. The first looks really at the neural basis of perceptual biostability and predictive processing in it. And uh, we found that um, visual cortex can detect conflict during uh, perceptual biostability, it's fed forward to prefrontal cortex, which can then change conscious experience via feedback to visual cortex. And I've shown you that this mechanism seems to be different in patients with schizophrenia, which might have implications for how to treat hallucinations in this clinical population. Um, yeah, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, if I got you interested in this work, and uh, here in the slides, you can see a few links to the studies that we have published in the last years. Um, and I usually have a link. So there's a website that you can go to. And there's also this talk. You can find it on there under talks here. And you also find links to publications and everything that, that you need. There's also a link to GitHub and our open uh, data, open science um, things. So we usually have all the data from the studies uh, open sourced uh, on GitHub or on OSF. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, it was great.